So uh, let's now move to uh, Richard Nixon's run in 1962, because uh, this probably does inform, you know, some of the ahistorical division between the Birchers, the crazies and the respectable Republicans, because he does he does try to draw that uh, that line himself um, not particularly successfully or, or make that division. Um, mm-hmm. What does his run uh, in, in 62 say to you about um, uh, uh, reflect on, on that on that time? Sure. So in 1962, of course, Richard Nixon running for a, a dog in 1962, <laughs> Richard Nixon is running for the California governorship and right. very much tries to draw a line between himself and the Birchers. The Birchers were very, very powerful and large in California. Um, they had control of a or at least very influential. And I believe it's called the California Republican Assembly, the CRA. And And basically when he drew that line and said, I am not like those guys. And in fact, we need to distance ourselves from these radicals. They basically made it their life's mission to never let Nixon get elected. And in 62, it works, right? Nixon loses in 1962. uh, And, and that's where the famous like quote to the media, you know, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. And he like huffs off uh, from his press conference, but the, 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 the point is that Nixon realized something. He had essentially touched the third rail. And the third rail of the conservative movement is the far right. They're the ones who are driving the bus, even if he didn't realize it at the time. And so when he comes back in 1968 and runs for president again, he's much more conservative. He does not make those distinctions as, as readily. Uh, he uses the phrase law and order. Again, that's a great example of that dog whistle politicking. It's not racism, but white people knew what he meant, mm. you know. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think that Nixon learned that lesson in 1962 and then corrected it in 68. And Goldwater and learned, Goldwater kind of learned, and he was more successful in, in, uh, representing both, uh, both poles of the, of the Republican party. Yeah. And Goldwater was absolutely part of the far right. They, they viewed him as one of their own. And that's one of the things that I think is so fascinating about historians. When they started writing history books about conservatism in the nineties, Goldwater played a huge role as this kind of beginning moment. And to me, Goldwater is not even the beginning, but really the culmination. This was the the far right believed that they had made it. In 1964, the Republican Party had its convention in San Francisco, and there were birchers on the ground floor. And when Nelson Rockefeller, the famous New York liberal, got up to speak to the to the Republican uh, you know uh, delegates and was trying to say that we need to move away from this extremism. He literally gets drowned out by booze and by chants of "We want Barry," and so the far right believed this was our moment. And then, of course, Goldwater gets absolutely obliterated in that election. Right. And so, for some people, they're like, "Okay, well, the far right is might maybe too much of a liability." But I think that's the wrong lesson. I think the actual lesson that they took from it is we can't be overtly extreme, but we still need those votes. And so they have to figure out a way to kind of thread that needle. And that's where I think the law and order rhetoric comes from and these sorts of things. They figure out that way to uh, to phrase their politics in such a way that appeals to both mainstream and the the far right. So is that a lesson they take from the shellacking that, that Johnson gives to to uh to Goldwater or, I mean, what were some of the lessons uh, learned there? So in the immediate, like in the immediate aftermath of Goldwater, I'm talking like the days afterwards, people all over the the newspapers in the country were basically declaring conservatism was dead, that, that this was, uh, you know, the end of conservatism that Goldwater had shown that this was a, you know, a cul-de-sac, right? A political a dead end. But, but William Buckley in one of his columns said that he thinks that the, uh, the grave diggers were premature. He didn't think it was over. And the reason why is because the movement had been built to the point where it could sustain itself. It wasn't just that you could topple over one candidate and that that was the end of it. There was still a sustained conservative movement on the ground level being led in part by the far right um, and at the top level being, you know, led by periodicals like National Review. And so to, to, to Buckley, the lesson was we need to kind of refine our rhetoric and we need to figure out a way to still get our politics across while maybe moderating our language. 
Well, and it ends up paying uh, dividends for them for them later. Um, it is interesting when, you know, talking about Goldwater, I can't help but think about, like, Hillary Clinton embracing, you know, what did she call herself? A Goldwater, a Goldwater girl? Goldwater girls, was, yeah. When, uh, when she was younger. Right, yeah. right, or, right, when she was younger, and she worked she worked for him, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, at the outset of her political uh, career, basically. And, you know, what maybe this is a bit, uh, you know, transition or transitioning to the present, but uh, it's amazing how they've, how conservatives have been so successful at normalizing their extremism. And until very recently, particularly in the 90s and after, getting like, 80% of what they wanted included uh, in democratic speak and embrace in the form of neoliberalism, frankly, but, um, and mm -hmm. also in welfare reform under Clinton. Like, they won so thoroughly the, the, this, the culmination of all of their work and organizing, frankly, paid dividends, not just in terms of, like, Reagan's landslides and uh, the the tax cuts, but the embrace of a lot of the platform in the the opposition party. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I mean, and the Democrats, rather than they, they never quite returned to the liberalism of the mid twentieth century. They just they just figured, well, that's over. We can't do that anymore. That's not where the politics, the the you know the the general American public is, and so they've shifted to this you know the triangulation the uh, the neoliberal era that we still continue to live in. It, it, what's interesting, though, is, is that conservatives are never quite, and I think this is true for any political ideology, but conservatives are never satisfied with the person that they have in power. Reagan's a great example. Reagan cut taxes. Reagan crushed unions. Reagan stripped away regulation. So very much a, an economic, you know, the, the libertarian economics, the, the for the swaggering foreign policy, but the religious right felt betrayed by Reagan. They didn't think that he did enough for them. And it's fascinating because now the religious right very much feels like Trump is there, um, you know, that, that Trump will do what they want him to do. I mean, look at the Supreme Court. Right. And so it's, you know, but but yet uh, Trump is not uh, there are still conservatives who believe that Trump is not um, not doing enough or didn't do enough in his presidency. Yeah, there, well, there's a there's an ideological discipline on the right uh, in terms of the way that the base can flex its muscle that is is just absent currently on the left. Frankly, I mean, we're see it's getting better, but um, it, it's nowhere near the apparatus that has been as you write. I mean, it's it's been a hundred years in the making, honestly. When I think part of the problem is that the 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 conservative movement has so much more financial heft available you know they have b billionaires who will just funnel money into think tanks and periodicals and whereas the left doesn't necessarily have that at their disposal and it's also hard especially if you're from a left-wing mindset to support a party that seems to punch left all the time yeah and and so as a result, it always feels like the Democrats, the the kind of left wing side of the political spectrum is so much more fractured. It also has a the harder time of trying to be a big tent. You know, nowadays, the the Democratic coalition is a lot creakier because it's just a bigger tent in many ways. And there's a lot more factions within it. And so it's it's difficult, you know, what the Democrats are trying to do. But this goes back to the the rhetoric. And I, and I agree with you that uh, the right is much, much more disciplined because even back in the 50s and 60s, they would recognize that, you know, Nixon's not perfect, but he's better than that guy. And so they would vote for him and then use that as a as a stepping stool up to the next big victory. Um, and, and the left just doesn't have that. And there's a lot of different reasons why. But that's just I think that is true. Well, I mean, I could rant about the Democratic Party uh, until I, I keeled over. But um, <laughs> I mean, I I, I do want to just emphasize how your book just makes it so clear that the battles that we're seeing or not even the battles, but the, the factions within the current conservative movement, it's really nothing new. Marjorie Taylor Greene versus Mitt Romney. I mean, that's that, that is the same big tent that you describe. And so to bring it back to where we really started our conversation, um, it, it's super clear to me that this there, they might be different 
shades within the same enemy. I mean, I perceive the right as an enemy, um, mm -hmm. but but they are one and the same. And so I I think that's fundamental to understanding the enemy is not to say, oh, that we want to go back to the good old days when there mm -hmm. were respectable re Republicans um, like like Goldwater or like William F. Buckley, mm -hmm. who yes. all were. This, it's just the same thing. It's just we don't have the historical literacy to to understand that in this country, frankly. I, I think what Pelosi and others are fail, fail to realize is that the difference between the radical conservatives and the mainstream conservatives, it's a difference of degree, but not kind, right? They're part of the same movement, but many times they're advocating for the same things, maybe just using different language. Exactly. All right. Well, uh, can't thank you enough. John uh, Huntington, you can check out his book, Far Right Vanguard, The Radical Roots of Modern Conservatism. Uh, John, thank you so much for, for your time today. I really appreciate the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Of course.